Well, welcome back, beloved ones, to another episode of Digging Deeper. I'm always appreciative of you tuning in. And today we're going to be back over in Psalm 16. Uh, you'll see here we're using a little bit of a different format, and that is because I want to show you several different places in Scripture. This format works better for that. You'll remember where we left off last time in Psalm 16. We were studying verses 7 through 10, and we got through verse 10, but we left off with a question. And the question was this, verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, David says, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And we ask this question, to whom is David referring in this verse? Because David died. His body was put in the ground. His body underwent decay. Now, the Lord didn't abandon David's soul to the place of the dead, but David's body did undergo decay. So who's David talking about when he says, you... Lord, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. That was the question we left off with last time. And what we're going to learn today is that David, in this psalm, was looking forward to the Messiah. David is describing here the one that God promised who would come from his own lineage and would reign forever. And the New Testament authors pick up on this as pointing to Jesus, and in particular, as evidence of Christ's resurrection, as scriptural evidence pointing to Christ's resurrection. And that's what I want to show you today. Two different places, both of them out of Acts. We'll start in Acts 13, just because this is the shorter one of the two. This is Paul's first missionary journey. Let me scroll up here. This is Paul's first missionary journey. He's in a place called Pisidian Antioch. Paul goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom of doing. And when Paul is given opportunity to speak, he gives in this chapter one of the best summaries of salvation history you're going to find anywhere. Paul starts with the Exodus, and he just gives the history of God saving his people right through the death and resurrection of the Messiah. But the resurrection was a key point of emphasis that Paul needed to give evidence for because Paul could tell the Jewish folks there in the synagogue and show them all the evidence of Christ fulfilling all of these messianic prophecies found in the scripture. But if Jesus was still in the grave, then none of that mattered. And so Let's just pick up here in the middle of Paul's sermon in verse 28. And though they found no ground for putting him, that's Jesus, to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. So Paul's speaking of the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus, but he has to give evidence for resurrection. And that's exactly what he does next. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Okay, Paul, where's the evidence for this? The evidence Paul gives, first of all, in verse 31 is eyewitness testimony. And for many days, he, that's Jesus, appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And so part of the evidence for Christ's resurrection that Paul gives is to say, look, there are eyewitnesses out there who are proclaiming Jesus the Messiah to people. There are living eyewitnesses who saw Jesus raised up from the grave. So he gives eyewitness testimony, and then Paul goes on to give scriptural testimony as to the resurrection. We'll start in verse 32. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he has raised up Jesus. Okay, where's the evidence for that, Paul? As it is also written. So he's going to give scriptural evidence. In the second Psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Verse 34, as for the fact 
that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. That's out of Isaiah 55. So Paul's pointing to the scriptural witness of resurrection. And then we get to verse 35. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. Well, where have we seen that before? Paul is pointing to Psalm 1610 as evidence that God said ahead of time he wouldn't allow his Holy One, the Messiah, to undergo decay. This is evidence that God would raise up from the grave the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to show in verse 36 that Psalm 1610 can't be about David. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. So Psalm 1610 can't be a reference to David. Paul is showing here, clearly, it's a reference to the Messiah and the resurrection of the Messiah. Verse 37, he makes this clear, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. So Psalm 1610 is about the resurrection of the Messiah. So if Jesus is the Messiah, which he is, and if Jesus was crucified, which he was, then Paul's argument is this, the Messiah must be raised up from the grave by God's own promise because he promised he wouldn't allow his Holy One to undergo decay. Okay, let me show you a second place where Psalm 1610 is quoted. This is uh, Acts chapter two. Peter is speaking here. Peter is giving a sermon to the people of Israel. Let me start in verse 22, and here's what Peter says. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So Peter here in this sermon does the same thing Paul does. He points to the death of Jesus. But of course, Peter also has to point to what happens next, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. And Peter needs to give evidence of this, which he does. Look at verse 24. But God raised him up again. There's the resurrection, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him, that's Jesus, to be held in death's power. Well, where's the evidence for this, Peter? Verse 25, for David says of him. So Peter's going to point us to scriptural evidence of the resurrection. And where does Peter point? To Psalm 16. He points to more than just Psalm 16.10. He points to several verses. For David says of him, that's of Jesus, I saw the Lord always in my presence. For he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. This is Psalm 16. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades or Sheol nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness within your presence. Just an interesting side note here. Charles Spurgeon has an interesting insight. Spurgeon thought that these verses were expressing or showing us Jesus's reliance upon God the Father as Jesus went to the cross, and he had this surety that God the Father would not abandon his soul to Hades, nor allow him to undergo decay. But Peter makes it clear here in verses 29 and following that David was looking forward, looking ahead to the Messiah when he wrote this psalm. Look at verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, 
that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he, that's David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. So in Psalm 16, verse 10, David's looking ahead and speaking of the resurrection of the Messiah. So let's just go back to Psalm 16 here. We see the resurrection of the Messiah was promised and spoken of before it ever happened. In fact, you think about the witness of scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, the birth of Jesus, the kind of life Jesus would live, the death of Jesus, here the resurrection of Jesus are all spoken of in great detail before these events ever even happened. And by the way, we should emphasize the people who lived prior to Jesus' coming were saved in the same way that we are today, by faith trusting in God's promise of salvation through the Messiah, who we know to be Jesus. Those Old Testament saints were saved, looking forward to the Messiah, trusting in all of those promises. We are saved by faith, looking back to the cross and resurrection. But Jesus and faith in Jesus has always been the basis for our salvation. So I hope it's helpful here to see Psalm 16 in its New Testament context, pointing to the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll finish up next time this psalm. We'll look at verse 11, and we'll make some comments in general about this psalm as we finish it up. Let's close with a prayer. Father, as we see Christ's resurrection emphasized both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we give thanks today for the sure hope that gives us for our own resurrection from the grave. Because Christ has been raised, so too shall we be raised. Father, we thank you that even before the foundations of the world, you foreknew us, you saw our need for a Savior and provided for that need with your own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again. Father, thank you for all those watching today. I pray that you would meet their needs, provide for them in every way. And Father, I pray that you would firmly fix our vision and hope upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. I'll see you next time.